You've arrived at the Frontline Records Rewind. Your host, Brian Healy of Dead Artist Syndrome, a little-known goth band. Executive producer, Adele Meisenheimer, and engineer, Scotty Z. You can find us here on a regular basis, so keep coming back. Right now, sit back, relax, and crank it up for Frontline Records Rewind... Hello, listeners. This is Adele Meisenheimer, filling in for host Brian Healy. Sadly, Brian is missing an episode that features one of his favorite people to walk the earth, Jean Eugene. Brainstorm Artists International, in partnership with Mize Music Group, released a new digital-only album called Remembering Jean Eugene. It includes the last three previously unreleased recordings that Jean made. With those three recordings, we get to hear testimony as told by his friends, peers, and artist friends. This is a really important project to Jean's parents, Jean and Carol. In fact, we brought Jean's dad into the studio at the farm to record an intro for this project. And here it is. Hi, this is Jean's dad. Ever since Gene's passing, his mother and I have heard many wonderful stories about how our son impacted people's lives, both in the music business and personally. And after many comments and inquiries about what was Gene working on before he left us, we discovered that within his last few weeks, he had been taping and editing two or three songs that he really liked, written by Leonard Cohen and Lucinda Williams. We found that the tapes were still in a rough draft, But after we listened to them, they were so emotionally moving and heartfelt that we thought that Gene's fans might appreciate something deep down from their friend. So we present on this CD the last three songs that Gene ever recorded in lasting memory of her beloved son and your good friend, Gene Eugene. Gene's good friend, Todd Zeller, has been kind enough to let us use some of his interview footage from his upcoming documentary film on Gene's life. Here are some thoughts from Gene's fellow musicians, industry peers, and other people whose lives were significantly influenced by my son. Gene was a colorful character, all right. Here's some first impressions when Michael Rowe, Ricky Michelle, Eric Tokel, and O. Joe Taylor first met Gene. He always struck me as an, an odd-looking man, a... Uh, you know, he was kind of, I didn't know what to make of him. He reminded me of somebody who came out of an old film from the 1930s, either a Three Stooges movie or a Bowery Boys movie. Something like that, you know. It, it was just, and his hair was always weird, you know. He'd always do these new weird things with his hair. I don't remember what his hair looked like then, but he and Michelle made a big impression on me at the time. I just thought they were really nice and interesting people. Well, he, um... He started coming to our church when I was about mm, 15 years old, I think, and uh, he would just be real quiet. Every once in a while he'd play piano for the offertory, and everyone would freak out because he was so good, and he'd play Amazing Grace and melt all the old ladies' hearts. My parents loved that. We became friends and started dating around that time, and he was already in a band with Greg and Paul at that time. So after a while, I just started singing back up with them, you know, and that was the beginning of Adam again. And I was 16. I think that was like, well, I won't tell you what year it was, but it was a while ago. (laughs) Then we got married and continued to do Adam again all that time. I came down here and had never been in the studio before, and uh, it was like the Millennium Falcon. I saw it, I said, what a piece of junk. And I'm like, I can't believe we're going to be able to do anything in this place. And uh, met Gene, and I'm like, so this is Gene Eugene, because I'd heard about him. I, I wasn't really familiar with his music or anything like that. So I wasn't starstruck or anything like that, because it turns out, you know, he's brilliant. Who knew? And that was the first time I saw Gene. I looked at this guy and thought, what a strange looking guy. Um, I honestly thought he was in his late 40s to, to probably 50 something years old it's just he just had that look about him with his chin and the way his hair was cut and he had like a perpetual five o'clock shadow now we get to hear from his 
Adam Again bandmates, the late Paul Valadez, Greg Lawless, Johnny Knox, and Ricky Michelle. He had an off the wall, off just quick sense of humor that, you know, I, I myself, I love making people laugh. You know, and if I can make you laugh out loud, real hard, real quick, I love it. But Gene had that sense. He, he could do that. <laughs> the right moment. The first few months, I couldn't believe it. It's hard to grasp. Just stunning. But I think, I think it's wearing in. He's gone. Gone, but not forgotten. I mean, I was always kind of in awe of what Gene could do as a songwriter, and not only as a songwriter, but as a singer and as a guitar player. You know, he's a great guitar player, he's a great keyboard player, and he could, he could play drums really well. You know, I always kind of knew this, but I don't think I really fully realized it till after he was gone, you know, that, man, he's, he is my favorite songwriter in the whole world over anybody. He just, he wrote amazing songs, and they're all true, you know, they, they're, they're so much truth you know because they came from his heart and I think because of that they you know they're universal at the same time but they were so close to his heart and just so true that you know I still listen to stuff once in a while and I you know kind of discover some other little thing you know that I that I never really noticed in the lyric for me it sheds a little light on on Gene's heart you know and, and him as a person too but yeah I mean I was really lucky to be in a band with a songwriter like that it was a true loss. I mean, I, I remember when I heard the news, it was like, I was like, I, I felt like someone was playing this mean joke on me. I just, I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, wow. I mean, of all the people to leave the earth, I would have thought Gene last, you know. Just never would have, would have pictured him to be gone so soon, but he did what he was supposed to do while he was here, and, and then bam, you just, you're gone. You just, your time here isn't promised. And just live each day to the fullest. And I, I think that, that Gene did that. And, uh, and I think it's an incredible loss. I, I, I miss him, I, uh, I love him, and knowing him definitely impacted my life. And it's, it's interesting how God just brings people in your life to do that. And I don't think I'd be sitting here talking to you today if I hadn't met him. When I started at playing with Adam again, I was like 18 or something like that and hadn't played in the studio. Gene basically taught me about that whole thing. He helped me get my first uh, professional drum set and I'll never forget that. I mean, he took a kid with just raw talent and saw something in him, and he helped mold me into uh, to a professional musician, as, as well as, uh, you know, helped me with my, my spiritual walk, too. I don't know, like I said, I don't know where I would be if I hadn't met Gene and, and the guys, you know. Caring. I mean, he was kind of private and kept everyone at, you know, an arm's length from him, but he was also pretty inclusive. I'm kind of speaking for all the other guys. It was more mysterious and different between the two of us, but I know that he just made, made the guys that he worked with feel completely accepted and a part of something really good and big, you know. He had a great sense of humor, so that was pretty inviting, too. Yes, everyone would agree that Gene had a great sense of humor. Here's his friends Ricky Michelle, John Knox, and Terry Taylor discussing one of his favorite topics. In the studio, Terry would bring these lyrics to the studio, working on his album, you know, or whatever, and Gene would be engineering, and inevitably, Gene would, like, twist the lyrics into lyrics about his butt. And it was so great, because it was kind of annoying, but it was really funny at the same time, you know, and Terry would have these, like, really incredible lyrics. He did this with all the bands, too. I'm sure, like, any band that you interview will tell you the same thing. That Gene would just, like, not just do it once, but sing the same butt lyrics instead of their lyrics to the same tune all day, you know, and, and then he would crack up at himself, like that was his whole like self-entertainment. And I love that about him, I just think that's so great and I know that's what everybody's going to miss the most, just how he was just so kind of free and easy to cut up and made people really comfortable in the studio and that was his gig, that was his environment, you know, so he was really comfortable there and it was easy for people to walk into that kind of situation. Oh man, I think how he always turned songs in, into something about his butt. <laughs> I think that's, it cracks me up, man. Uh, he just take things and start singing about his butt. <laughs> I think that was a, uh, a memorable thing. Just as, I, I just, I think I miss his smile and the way that he just cracks up and we're joking around. It just, 
that camaraderie we had. I, I really miss that. I shared this at the memorial. You know, a lot of songwriters sort of look at their lyrics and that sort of thing as sort of sacred ground. You know, you don't mess with them. You don't make fun of them. With my band down through the years, I've, I've sort of gotten used to them taking, you know, my lyrics and twisting them around. And Gene was, you know, a master at it. But I said this at the memorial, and some people were a little bit taken aback by it, but it got a laugh. You know, I just said, well, Gene managed to take every song that anybody had ever written and turn it into a song about his butt. Eric Tokel began his career in music under Gene's leadership and signed his first deal with Gene while playing bass in the band Rich Young Ruler. Gene was really his mentor in sound recording there at the Green Room. Here's some words from Eric. The most moved I was ever by one of Gene's songs was uh, at a live show they did at the Whiskey with, with Lost Dogs. I think it was in 1996. And I don't even know the name of the song, but uh, he wrote it for a friend of his that had passed away. He sang it with this honesty, man. Like, it, it probably was the hundredth time he'd sang the song. But he just got up there and introduced the song, said, I wrote this for a friend of mine that passed away, and just started singing. I'd never heard it before. And I was with some friends of mine, Anna Cardenas, who was a partner here at the studio and everything, and she was just instantly in tears. And I looked at her and kind of nodded my head, and I knew exactly where Gene was coming from and why she was reacting that way. I mean, he had that ability to communicate honest feelings and honest pain and everything. And that, I think that was, for me, was the most full expression of that. If I had my way, I'd be in your town. I might not stay, but at least I would have been around. Cause there's something about what happens when we talk. make sense Does it matter anyway Is it coincidence Or was it meant to be Cause there's something about what happens when we talk Something about what happens about what happens when we talk There's something about what happens I can't stay around Cause 
I'm going back south My only regret is That I never kissed your mouth Yeah, there's something about what happens when we talk Something about what happens when we talk Something about what happens when we was Something About What Happens When We Talk by Lucinda Williams. Of course, this recording wouldn't be complete without hearing from the Lost Dogs bandmates, Terry Taylor, Derry Doherty, and Michael Rowe. His passing, of course, was a shock and something that um, will always be a scar, you know. The great thing that happened to me, I think it was about two weeks before Gene passed away, I had gotten in my car to come over and discuss some business things with Gene, and, and there were some hurdles that we had to get over, and I, I knew he would be gracious and, and all that. And as I was driving in the car, I had a real impression from the Lord that this was not going to be about business. And Gene was a guy that was on the go all the time. He had, always had a phone, always was going room to room. It was hard to, you know, hard to sort of nail down and, and just talk. And he and I had a lot in common. We talked movies. We talked music. Um, he loved the Dodgers. I'm a Dodger fan. We go, we went to games together and he called them the bums. And, uh, and so we had, we had all that. But the day that I, that I was coming over here, my intention to talk to Gene about business stuff, uh, and the impression that this wasn't going to be about business. And I didn't know what it was going to be about. And I'm not going to go into detail, but just to say that we sat down literally for a couple of hours talking about our faith, talking about life. And Gene opening up in a way I'd never before seen him open up. And I think that was meant to be. I really do. I'll always miss him. Uh, every day I think of him. Not a day goes by that I don't think about him. His voice, his voice broke my heart. His passing has broken my heart. But I think that in a way, this is God's sort of mysterious way of creating character in us and learning to face life head on and, and learning to cherish our friends because we don't know what a day is going to bring. I think my relationship with, with Gene was rich and full, and I, and I thank the Lord for that. Everybody, I think, will say the same thing, that Gene had an overwhelmingly kind heart, and he loved his friends, and he loved, he had a real compassion for, for, for the, kind of the downtrodden. You know, Gene was always the guy that if we're walking down the street in Chicago on a tour, some guy's on the corner, he's going to hand him five bucks. Or he's gonna, he, he was that kind of guy. He was just going to do it. He was one of the few guys I know that was never really, never really talked mean about anybody. Never really had too many bad things to say about people. Always find good, you know. He'd always have a couple good things to say, even on the worst situations. He'd have a couple good things to say. After every gig we'd do with Lost Dogs, we'd end up usually end up at a restaurant or somewhere late night. And Gene would always end up. You'd see Gene, and he'd always end up at a table or something with some character, just kind of talking to him and laughing and hanging out. And and you just realized with him that he, he had a really deep soul. There was a lot there and really warm, was one of those guys that if you were at the green room for any period of time, you always saw this strange cast of characters coming in and out. And uh, a lot of them were the downtrodden and homeless, and a couple of them were drug addicts, and, and just a weird bunch of people. And Gene always, always had a place for those people. And it wasn't like he was condoning what they did or whatever. He was just, he was being real Christ-like, and he was just kind of loving them. You know, he would just open his studio to him. He'd open his room to him. He'd open the kitchen to him. He would constantly, constantly prove over and over again that he was a compassionate guy. Oh, I miss him terribly. Yeah, I think about him all the time. You know, I think they're. Pro I think I probably think about him once a day, also at least. You know, if there's something that happened, some song I listen to, or some um, story that somebody tells that reminds me of Gene. You know, and I think of just all these great times we had. We spent a lot of time together, and you know, he, I, I miss him terribly. 
the main impression I have about all of this is that this always felt like we were getting away with something. This always felt like it was a gift from God to us and, and for no reason of our own. It's not like we were extra good so we got this extra treat from God. It was to the contrary. I felt like, you know, Gene and I went down some pretty dark paths in the 90s and I think that in spite of a lot of that, God was always behind us giving us this gift and reminding us that he's the giver of all good things and that this band represented a real blessing from God. And in spite of ourselves, in spite of our sins, in spite of our weaknesses, it seemed like there was this little special place that we got to go every few years and have this fellowship. You know, and we're men. We carried on like men do. It wasn't like it was some godly scene where we would all have prayer before the session, but we always sensed this overarching presence of God in giving us this gift, this band, this music, the sound, and the way it came together so specially without really a lot of gargantuan effort. It seemed like it was just dropped in our laps. And throughout the 90s, I would say that I look back on that decade very fondly because of the lost dogs. And in addition to all the other good things that happened to me or bad things, the dogs was one little place. I just felt like this is too good to be true. So when we lost Gene, I started to reflect on that. And I realized that well, it, yes, it was too good to be true because God knew it was going to end and he knew when it was going to end. And in a sense, he was giving us something really good that he had to give to us right away because he knew when Gene would check out. And he also knew what this would mean to us for the rest of our lives as surviving members, you know. That's really amazing to me because it speaks to me of God's sovereignty, of his timing, and that he really truly was giving us something that he had to give us right now. It w couldn't have happened earlier, and it couldn't have happened later. It happened right then. Hey there, folks. My name is Todd A. Zeller. I own a small video production company called Eden Z Films. We have had a documentary on the music of Adam again sitting on the shelf for way too many years, and good Lord willing, it'll see the light of day sooner than later, thanks to you and your support. We will be doing a Kickstarter promotion real soon, and uh, we want you to jump on board and uh, hopefully see this phenomenal little 90-minute documentary film about our beloved uh, band Adam Again and Gene Eugene, with some great interviews from all across the board, from the surviving members of Adam Again, interviews from home movies of Gene when he was a kid, to interviews with Jars of Clay, Mac Powell, The Violet Burning, The Prayer Chain, all of the lost dogs, so many artists that Gene nurtured along the way um, and were impacted by the Adam Again sound, the live performances of Adam Again. Keep an eye out uh, on the Facebook page for Adam Again, the Frontline page, and here and there you'll see more to be revealed very in the coming months regarding the film. We'd love your support. We'd love an opportunity for you to collaborate with us and see it to fruition. And now with the loss of Paul, uh, even more reason for a call to action and a call to band together and recognize that this band is our house will be a great little film and a tribute uh, in honor of Gene, Paul, and the remaining members of Adam again. Thanks for your time. Michael Knott was a close friend of Gene's and they recorded many projects together. And Michael Pritzel of The Violet Burning learned a lot from Gene. Here's some words from them. I was glad I was able to um, sing his songs and things and yeah. he has great songs and it was quite an experience to, to be involved in that and uh, so I considered it a privilege to yeah. do that. He always had a really good outlook on life. I never really saw him depressed or anything, he was always happy. Always wanted to help out bands. No matter what band he'd produce or work with, he'd always find something that he liked about their music, even if it wasn't necessarily his style of music. He just really believed in the best of people. He loved baseball. If we went to 7-Eleven, he'd have to pick up the baseball weekly thing. But yeah, he was into, into the Dodgers, that's for sure. I went to a Dodger game with him before, yeah. It was really fun. We, uh, he sh showed me how to sneak up to the front, and then uh, I think we uh, poked fun at uh, Barry Bonds from the from the sidelines about his shoes or something. I can't remember. When I first met Gene, and he first started recording an EP that we did called Lily and Gish, and co-producing it, and he was the first person to turn me on to songwriters like Leonard Cohen and Towns Van Zant and he would point out their lyrics. So he was the, really the first person to, to really encourage me as a lyricist to dive in more into who I am and to give more stuff away. So working with Gene was always challenging for me to try to be 
the best lyricist that I could be and to be the best songwriter that I could be. And, and prior to that, I hadn't really had a mentor who really pushed me to be a great songwriter. So Gene was solution to things. And I would call him and I would be such a perfectionist and so worried. Gosh, Gene, I don't know what I'm gonna do about this. You know, I know the bass is completely out of tune and you know, it's too late, you know. The record's mixed and it's out of tune and I can't fix it, the guy's out of town. And, and he would be like, oh, you know, you know, and he would kind of give it this kind of attitude that was just like, you know, I can't tell you how many nights I've stayed up worrying about the bass being out of tune. And, you know, and he just would kind of make it seem like, you know, Mike, it, it'll be all right. You know, and he just kind of had this, this attitude that projected confidence, you know, and learning to be satisfied with your work. You know, he realized that you couldn't always make things to the best of your imagination. You know, there were always things within recording that that you had to settle for, and that you, that you know it's gonna it would be okay, and and most people wouldn't notice it. You know, so for me, having Gene to kind of turn to for guidance and for direction was always a big deal in my life. I looked up to him so much. It's four in the morning, the end of December I'm writing you now just to see if you're better New York is cold, but I like where I'm living There's music on Clinton Street all through the evening I hear that you're building your little house Deep in the desert You're living for nothing now I hope you're keeping Some kind of record And Jane came by With a lock of your hair She said can I possibly say I guess that I miss you I guess I forgive you I'm glad that you stood in my way and if you ever come by here 
for Jane or for me Well, your enemy is sleeping And his woman is free Famous Blue Raincoat by Leonard Cohen. Now, Gene influenced a lot of artists and bands. He hosted many at the Green Room, and one of those was The Prayer Chain. They released their album Antarctica on Gene's label, Brainstorm Artists International. Another band that was really encouraged and influenced by Gene was Jars of Clay. Here they are. One great memory for me was, I don't know why, but my wife and I came over here one night and picking up something or whatever and just ended up hanging out with Gene for a little while and he went to the garage and he had that like electric piano and he was about to go do some dates with not just him solo and not solo. I'm like, so what are you going to do, man? Play some stuff. And he just started playing like River on Fire, just singing a cappella to this electric piano that wasn't even plugged in, so it was barely making any noise, but it was just like, whoa, you know, it was just incredible and stuff. Me, my wife, and Jean, you know, great memory. It was amazing when, you know, we'd come and work here and there'd be like a, you know, the band is, is doing stuff and everybody's got ideas and everyone exchanges all these different things and people start getting into an argument and, no, I think it should go like this or, no, I hear something different here. And then he would come walking into the room and, like, he'd go, hey, look, you know, I got an idea. And, like, the, min the minute he did that, the whole room would go silent because everyone wanted to hear exactly what his idea was. And they wanted to hear it, like, all the way through as well. They didn't, you know, they weren't going to interrupt him or anything. In his own way, he kind of, like, demanded that respect, but it was never something imposed. It was always something that everyone respected him so much that whenever he had an idea, everyone wanted to hear it. Everyone knew that he knew what he was hearing, and he never gave you anything false. He just made the music that he made in or outside of any CCM circles, that's how he earned the respect from all of us in that way, by just doing the music his way. I think he probably enjoyed the fact that he was always slightly on the fringe of it because it uh, semi-validated that he was doing something right. If he was completely accepted into that world, then he wouldn't be challenging them in any way. And I think that's something that he secretly probably, you know, enjoyed. I wasn't exposed to a lot of uh, Christian music that I thought really captured what was actually going on in music. That's kind of new to the scene of just rock and roll. You know, when you become an adolescent, you kind of decide, you know, that's the cool thing. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't much I really dug. Uh, uh, <laughs> and um, Adam again and the choir were two bands I think I heard where I was like, wow, this is somebody that's kind of taking faith and issues of following Christ and making it in, in such a, a great way of expressing uh, their faith through art. That hooked me right away, especially the, the song Deep on Dig, I think is the, the record. Just blew me away with the simplicity of his lyric and his, his vocal style, uh, a Gene Eugene that is. I think I read about Adam again, like in the True Tunes, like just ordering the mail stuff during high school and getting into some of the lesser known Christian acts and, and some of the California stuff and just the association I think with the choir. Um, Steve and I kind of grew up in different states but into <laughs> similar things. And I think the first, I think picked up the tape of 10 songs by Adam again. And the, like the soul edge to it kind of intrigued me because it was sort of a rock and roll thing but it had this vintage soul kind of sound that 
I hadn't really listened to much of, I guess at that point, and and particularly Ain't No Sunshine. I don't know if I'd ever heard that song before, but their version of it I loved. And and a year ago we had covered Ain't No Sunshine a little bit in our show, and it took me back to the, the Adam Again days. And I, I'm hunting for ten songs on CD and haven't been able to find it. But yeah, I think there was just a raw, a raw passion and, and a realness about everyday difficult things that he wasn't afraid to tackle and, and he obviously didn't really care what the market was doing or you know what what sort of I guess industry standards he was fulfilling you know he, he did it because he believed in it and it was from his heart and um, that's that connected with with whoever had that record I think for me uh, when I heard Jeannie Jean had passed away I didn't have a lot of contact with him personally uh, he, he came out to a show we did in LA which I thought was awesome because never put a face with the, the music and the voice and that, that was that was a pleasure and a, uh, a gift uh, to be able to have met him. Frank Lenz was one of Gene's go-to drummers for recording at the Green Room. You know him pretty well as you can tell by some of his Gene-isms. Here's some Gene-isms. Well, how's that Gene? Well, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I want to come in and listen to it. It's all right. You know. Hello? Oh, hello? No, yeah. No, it's to it's fine. Just leave it there. It's fine. No, tell him I'll call him back. Well, I can't call him back. Yeah, hello? Hello? Yeah, hey, Gene. Oh, yeah. Hey, Frank. Listen, um, can you come down? This band, they don't have a whole lot of money. And I'm really trying to help them out. And, uh, if you could just come down, I promise, I promise you, it'll only take, like, an hour. An hour of your time. It's just one song. Oh, yeah, Gene. Hello? Yeah, okay. Oh, oh Frank? Yeah, look, man, uh, really, look, there's this band here, and uh, we just need a bar. Can you bring some snare drums and cymbals down? It was like, it was qu quite often that that would happen. Rob Watson helped Gene contract musicians like string and horn players, played keyboards and wrote arrangements. It was really good practice because Rob ended up being the musical director for, for Donna Summer. We were recording at the choir's studio. I think it was called Neverland or something like that. And we pretty much just rolled tape. And he brought out of me that same kind of insecurity, honesty, anger, and doubt on the keyboard parts that I did for that. And we just rolled and I would play the part and then all of a sudden anger would strike me and I just would hit the keys or something. We did a few takes like that where there were no holds barred. And I think the wackiest and wildest of the takes wound up being the keepers. And he had that kind of way of connecting with those that he worked with on an emotional level, bringing the best out of everybody. Ojo Taylor was a fellow visionary with Gene. They were business partners in forming Brainstorm Artists International. They went on a lot of adventures together. Strangely, I can remember the date. It was May, probably the first week of May in 1983, because um, the day the God Rules album came out, we were playing at Ontario Church of God. There was this band that was going to open for us called Martis. Well, uh, let's see, Gene was the singer in that band, Paul Valadez was the bass player, Greg Lawless was the guitar player, Sim Wilson was the vocalist. Uh, so I guess Gene was the, the, the second guitar player and, and songwriter. And um, I can't remember who the drummer was, but that's the, actually the first time I met Gene. The first time I actually worked with him was about a year later when our drummer Gary Olson ran into Sim Wilson on the street. They were both driving, they pulled up to a signal next to each other and we had been looking for a new singer. And Gary rolled down his window and hollered out to Sim, hey would you like to audition? And Sim said yeah. We hired Sim on and uh, shortly after Sim said well Gene from, from Martis is a pretty good sound man, why don't you bring him on to run sound for, for you guys? And so we did and that's, that's kind of how actually Gene and I and Undercover hooked up professionally was that he became our sound man. The way he, uh, you know, would take the song and program the beats and do fills on the fly and stuff, it was obvious that he had a feel for how a drum should be, but he could easily pick up how drums should be in a punk song uh, on a punk record, and he obviously had control of the technology. It was about a year after that that Brainstorm started, and we started working together almost, you know, on a daily basis. I'd like to tell you that a lot of what Gene and I did was for some high and lofty ideal, but a lot of the times it was just because we needed a way to find our next rent check, you know? <laughs> And it was precisely the outcome of that whole CBA adventure that we couldn't find anyone that was willing to take a chance on us as musicians and, and um, producers. 
that we just, uh, and it was actually Gene's idea, he, he said, look, why don't we just do this ourselves? Kind of, I, I guess, in a sense, having a vision of what we wanted to do artistically and creatively, but, but also setting those artists that we chose to work with free to, to do what they want. In some cases, we were just uh, the right guys at the right time, and in other cases, we were just sincere enough that people trusted us with their art. I consider that we were lucky enough to be the guys to push the buttons. Actually, Ojo and Gene hired me back in the day to manage licensing and royalties for Brainstorm Artists International. So in a small way, I had a little piece of Gene in my life as well. He touched so many. Todd Zeller is a filmmaker, and he's producing an Adam Again documentary that, of course, includes a lot of footage from Gene's life. Can't wait to hear it and see it. Here's Todd. I got to know Gene a little bit in 1997 was when I was first really introduced to him by Greg Lawless. Uh, Gene was always genuine, very transparent, very open, you know, very kind and, and, and just generous with his time. And of all rock stars, Gene, Eugene Andrusco did not carry the typical rock star persona or um, attitudes, you know. He left that at the door for sure. I liked that. He was very real about his struggles about his humanity and about how he wrestled with the hard things in life, you know, divorce and loss of loved ones and faith that's being uh, challenged daily. And hearing those three songs just really reminded me of how much I miss Gene Eugene. To purchase your own copy of these three songs, previously unreleased by Gene, and the thoughtful look at his life and music by friends. You can get them on iTunes, Amazon, and FrontlineRecords.us. Here's Coming Back to You by Leonard Cohen.
I know I could never get it right Even when you've been to give me comfort in the night So I gotta have your word on this Or none of it is true And all I've said is just instead said it's just instead of coming back to you mm, that is so beautiful thanks for being with us today as brian would say grace and peace may all your hopes and dreams come true